just waiting for people's audio to connect before we get started. All right, we are just about there. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the second session of today. This is our first of two great question sessions that we're putting on as part of this forum. Um, and I'm gonna go through a few kind of set the table slides and then we'll hand it over to our two question moderators for today. Your hosts for today, all from the membership committee of the BitCurator Consortium, are Annalise Berdini, Joe Carano, Sally DeBosch, myself, Farrell. We have a code of conduct moderator, Elena Colon Marrero, and our two tech liaisons from Educopia, Brandon Locke and Eric Martin. Reminders, this session is governed by the code of conduct, which we talked about in the opening session, but if you need a refresher, as well as the community agreement, we agree to one person speaking at a time, Everyone has something to contribute. Aim for a more equitable participation. Please feel comfortable participating, even if you're unsure about terminology, concepts, et cetera. Beware and consider it of time. Embrace curiosity and acknowledge the difference between impact and intent. Some instructions. Ask a question. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, it can be about anything related to workflows, policies, things you're struggling with, or something you'd like some community advice or guidance on. You can use this form that I've just chatted uh, to ask the BCC. The URL is now in large text on this slide itself, but that is also chatted in the, the chat box. These can be anonymous. I think you have the option to put your name on there if you want, but they can be totally anonymous. We will be sorting the questions based on progressive stack. For those who are not aware of progressive stack, it's a method for giving marginalized groups a greater chance to speak. This identification is not public in any way to view, and that information collected will be deleted after the event. So when you're asking your question, you have the option to mark it uh, as, as something that should be stacked progressively. Submitted questions will be viewable at this link and also on the screen in just a moment. That link is chatted here, tiny URL dot com great q and a and you can answer a question if you want using the form uh at this url we're chatting right now um you can also enter your answers into the zoom chat we have uh, sally monitoring the chat for any question or any answers that come in that way um and if you wish to uh, speak on mic. Um, you can use the raise hand feature. I'm monitoring the participation, the participant list for any raised hands. Um, just know that we are recording this uh, session. So if you if you let that factor into your decision whether or not you want to go on mic. So again, the URL for asking a question is tinyurl.com ask BCC. Answering a question is answer BCC or use the Zoom chat or raise your hand. And we will be uh, using um, we're going to be sharing a screen to kind of view all the questions and answers as they go. Thank you. Oh, yes, Jess, thanks for that context. The raise hand is under the dot, 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 more on the Zoom menu interface. And just credits to Slides Carnival for this theme. I'm going to sharp sh stop my share now uh, and hand it off to the question moderators. All right. Hi, everybody. We're excited to get this session started today. Um, I'm Annalise. I'm going to be one of the question moderators and I'll lead us off today. Um, and Joe will be, uh, Joe and I will be trading off on reading out questions and answers. So um, let's get started. We got a lot to work through already. So beginning with question one, are people including submission documentation in their apes? If yes, what are you including? Donor agreements, PII reports, other files. And we've got a couple answers already. We've got, uh, we include some of this information. 
file characterization reports via Brunhilde, documenting the state of the digital objects upon receipt and post-processing, sensitive data review reports via bulk extractor, and optionally additional notes documenting decisions made during the acquisition or pro uh, processing workflows. We include a sidecar folder we call accession info with every ape. It has all the reports and metadata that were generated throughout the process of ingest and processing. And I'll give it a little moment to see if anybody has anything else they want to add. Oh, there we go. Photos of media and DFXML to accompany disk images. I see in chat, we have an answer. We don't put PII in our dams. Thank you for that. Another answer, nope, that all lives elsewhere, but I will add a readme.txt if there's especially relevant information or a special situation. All right, we've got a good few answers to that one, so I think Unless there's anybody else that wants to add in anything before we move on, it will move us to the next questions so we can get through things. One more refresh and sorry for all the, there we go. Okay, on to the next one. Thank you so much for that question and for all those great answers. I am brand new to the environment. The how-to videos are not helpful due to small differences in my unconnected system. How can I get the most basic baby steps video or help to get me started? And we have uh, one answer so far, not a perfect answer. Written documentation may be useful here. The BitCurator Quick Start Guide is one such resource. And again, I'll give it a moment for folks to add any additional answers that they might have or suggestions, whether in chat or you can raise your hand or use the form. Another answer, you may want to reach out to the BCC list and ask for a coach to screen share with you that you can record. That's a great suggestion. Um, from Laura in the chat, is the question about BitCurator Suite or digital archiving in general? If the person who asked this question wants to clarify that, please feel free to do so. I'm reading this as about the BitCurator Suite personally. Yep, BitCurator. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> If it helps, I know that we've been talking a lot in the EC um, about training opportunities and updating um, what we have available. It's kind of just about having enough resources and time to put that kind of assistance together. So um, just a plug for the documentation and training committee, if anybody feels like that's something they'd be uh, interested in helping assemble. <laughs> um, and I'll give it one more moment if anybody's got anything else to add. And Sarah is open to coaching. If anyone has time and uh, capability to do that, that'd be awesome. All right, moving on to the next question. Hi, I'm curious about best practices, what other places are doing with digital media, like CDs, flash drives, floppy disks, etc., after the files have been removed or copied off. Should the physical items be retained and stored with other collection materials or discarded? Wow, we have a lot of answers to this already. This is great. 
Uh, first one, we are in the process of defining the difference between a transfer device versus an archival object. Often files are just placed on flash drives for transport to us and others need to be kept to preserve the file system or interacti interactivity. We discard them after a designated period. There's a policy decision we made, or that's a policy decision we made as the original media are not a good long-term preservation medium and not likely to be accessible in the long run due to obsolescence of the necessary equipment. Like the other responder, we retain media transfer devices for a certain policy length of time. If the media transfer device is more than just for transfer, it is possibly acquired as part of the collection or as an accessory. And in those cases, they are retained indefinitely and stored with the collection materials, separated per standard storage assessment slash conservation needs like anti-static containers. We are securely destroying the media after completing our full workflow and depositing files into our institutional preservation repository. And last answer here, we keep them with the collection, but I'm usually dealing with legacy media for collections that have already been processed. So it's less time consuming to just put them back than to re-describe or rearrange the collection. And I'm seeing some good chat activity here, let's see. If anyone has publicly available definitions of transfer device and archival object, that would be awesome to share. From Diane, thank you. And a link dropped in from Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. And a plus one to Diane's comment from Elvia. Thank you. Hopefully that can address that question, additional question. One more answer in the form. We do not keep the physical media unless there is an artifactual value to the media itself. This is rarely the case, so we toss them with our university's media recycling facilities. Give it one more moment. We got lots of answers though to this one. So I think we are pretty well covered unless anybody has any available resources to share in the chat. Okay, I will hand it over to Joe to go through the next three questions. All right, um, so our next question, how do other institutions approach having a non-networked computer to do initial virus checks on files before ingest? Laptop or desktop, any advice for keeping the antivirus software on that non-networked computer up to date? And we've got one answer so far. We have a Dell laptop running Ubuntu and BitCurator. We've never hooked it up to Wi-Fi and just connect to Ethernet cable when we need network access, e.g. when running FreshClam. We've got another response. We use a laptop that I disconnect for the virus sweep and then reconnect after virus scan. Remediation is complete. While we wait for, for more responses, I guess I can give an anecdote. Um, recently, I had scanned something already from a collection, but once I brought our computer back on the network, the university's uh, virus scanning found something it also considered a virus. Um, and so these are like actively running on our computers anyway, when the network is connected. So that was an interesting um, 
thing to encounter. Um, so we've got a few more responses. We do the same, but since it's not used super frequently, it often needs to run updates when we start it up after a dormant period. Um, and then we've got, we use two desktops on their own tiny network with no external connections, one with Big Creator and one with Windows. Our IT department updates the antivirus software periodically. We have three desktop computers. We use Ethernet when we need internet. The workstations do not connect to server storage automatically, and we have scripts to mount those when we need to transfer materials to the backlog or processing areas. So it sounds like a lot of people doing similar things. I think we're, we'd probably be good to move on. Has anyone success, successfully migrated content, specifically accession records from InMagic DB Textworks to another system such as Atom? And one answer, I believe artifactual systems can be paid for this kind of migration, but I've had no direct experience with this service. This is just word of mouth. Accession records can be imported to Adam using CSV templates as well. And there's a link. Hopefully someone can help you. I've never heard of that uh, software before, but um, yeah, if there's a user's group, maybe you can find someone who's, who's in a similar plight. All right, one more refresh maybe and um, we can move on to the next one. I've got a lot of answers. What do you do when you detect infected files, say with clam scan for incoming collection material? What factors inform your decision to keep infected files? Do you describe these files? And we've got one thing to do is to have a protocol for quarantine, decide how long this needs to be for, often 31 days for virus checkers to update. This can be most effective for current acquisitions less ingests. We don't keep infected files. We create a tarball excluding the malware. Another person, we do some quick research on the CLAM AV result then review the file manifest to attempt to determine three things, value of the file, whether the file is critical to our work or access use of other files in the collection and potential info security risk. We document these files, the factors, and our decision along with collection admin documentation. And the next answer, unfortunately, for each instance, I would advise that you do some research on the malware, malware slash vulnerability that is being detected. We had some image files that were flagged as they could potentially use part of, as part of an exploit, but decided to keep them intact as the software necessary to, necessary to enact the exploit. We're all obsolete and obsolete and would never be used. So the files pose little to no risk. Always remember that with antivirus software, 
There can be false positives. Also remember that malware infected files may have important research value. There's also um, a website called Virus Total, I think, that um, if you don't have sensitive content, you can upload the file in question and see what other tools say about it being a virus, other virus checkers. Diane in the chat says, compare checksums of files to things in the um, NSRL, which is the National Software Research Library. I'm not positive on that, but that's the NIST. Oh, someone put that in the, in the air table, but that's a NIST, um, database. Follow-up question. What is the point of quarantining infected files? Uh, from the original question or answer, I think it's to allow for virus software to update if this is like a new, um, a new virus that might not be in, uh, databases or something like that. But I can let the, the answer also follow up if they have a more specific idea. And we've got, oh, that's, just another thing from the chat. All right, I think one more refresh and I think I'm handing it off to you again, Annalise. Sounds good. All right. What are others doing in terms of renaming files during processing? Do you typically keep the creator's file names or rename? And we've got lots of answers to this already. First one is we retain the original file names wherever possible. In cases where we choose to rename, we maintain documentation of the file names as received, which we can modify to include both the original file name and the changed file name. Next answer, we frequently rename for a variety of reasons. Sometimes because original file names are too long, contain problematic characters, or are simply opaque. We generate a file manifest on ingest that documents the original file paths and file names, so there is a record of that. But in general, we don't try to keep detailed records of every individual change made. We do not rename except in the rare cases where the file names have special characters that can cause issues in our pipeline. In these rare cases, we make a log of the rename and include it in a readme note or zip the files to avoid renaming. Next answer says, I'm working with our multimedia team to create a standard practice of naming conventions for our department. Another archivist told me that consistency in file names will be the key and communicating those with your team. And lastly, we get a lot of small single carrier collections that we process with a space that were created with the aim of becoming the collection. With these, we rename them for upload. For larger, more complicated nested carriers to be browsed on site only, we would probably leave file names as is. Okay, do a refresh. Mm 
one more. Here's another answer. It depends on how the materials come to us. For example, we're in the midst of building a community collection and most of the images are cell phone images titled something like IMG2784. We rename them to be more descriptive. In other cases, like things that come from university offices, we often retain those because the file name is important to the context. We have one more update, but we've got a lot of good answers here, so I might move us on to the next one. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, um, just checking, nothing in the chat. Great. Moving on. Um, oh, I think we got one that popped up. Okay, what are some of the reasons why Brunhilde would identify different files as duplicates? For example, there is a folder with all different photos with different but similar file names that are being by identified by Brunhilde as duplicates. I think this is a new question, so we'll give folks a chance to answer. Couple of answers in the chat. Farrell says, I don't have a great answer, but I wonder if the CSV reports Brunhilde also creates could offer some clue. LB says, I'm not quite sure what the question is asking. Brian says, I believe it's because the paths are unique. So Elvia, I think the question is asking that they're getting, Brunhilde is generating a report that files are duplicates, but they don't actually seem to be duplicates when looked at. They have different names and the images are different. But if the question asker is here, please feel free to clarify. Do refresh here. Okay, here we go. So we've got some suggestions. It's looking at hashes, which would be the same even if the files have different names. Uh, and Brunhilde identifies based on checksum. If the files are zero bytes, they could have the same checksum. And from Joe in the chat, it checks against the checksums that Siegfried creates. Thanks, everybody. All right. I think... Give this one more, we will move on to the next one. Okay. Seeking recommendations for a bare minimum Mac compatible setup and workflow for a solo archivist to receive and accession digital collections. We have the hardware to transfer over content received on hard drives or removable media, but what actions should be performed on it when we get it? What tools do we need and where should the files live? So we have one answer so far. Any processing of Macintosh material, especially pre-2009, should be evaluated prior to moving to ensure resource forks are kept if needed. Other HFS data can be used to identify file types. HFS utils or HFS Explorer are a great set of tools for evaluating content.
While we're waiting for additional answers to that question, we just had a couple more in the chat to our previous. Laura asked, what are the chances of having the same hash value when the files are visibly different in content? And Farrell said, depends on the hash algorithm. Um, and Grant said that a uh, good idea re regarding the empty files, all zero byte files have the same MD5, which is, I mean, I did not know that, that's wild. So thank you for those answers. some lively chat happening regarding the checksums in the previous question. <laughs> All right. Oh, here we go. Other answer. I am also a solo digital archivist piecing this all together. My bare bones method right now is following the three, two, one rule. Three copies, two on different types of media, one copy stored offsite. It will be good to create a digital items accessions checklist of what to look for, when to keep it, and how to store it. The tools I'm currently using to store files is our shared drive and external hard drives, along with a catalog management system. We currently do not have the staff or finances for additional software, so checking files for integrity is a manual process, unfortunately. But we are making cases to bring to our IT for a supportive server and software tools. Building a close relationship with your department and IT to generate buy-in will help you purchase the tools you need. And in chat, Tyler shared a Google Doc link uh, to a list of useful Mac HFS resources. Thank you for that. And thank you for our other response in the table. Let's see if we got any more. Sarah asks, all these solo digital archivists piecing this together, myself included, should we have a group to help each other out? I think that's always a great idea. <laughs> All right, I'll give one more refresh and then hand it over again to Joe. Lots of support <laughs> for a solo digital archivist group in the chat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, because that sounds like a great uh, idea and very useful to a lot of people. All right, one more just in case. Okay, handing off to Joe. Okay, in cases where you receive a backup of someone's workstation or an entire office's workstations, is there a way to identify system files that can be weeded either by extension or where a directory sits in a typical Mac or Windows directory structure? And we've got a first answer. NIST maintains the National Software Reference Library. Um, that includes hashes or files included in various software distributions. Searching across an unknown target set of objects against the NSRL would help identify which files in the target are files unchanged since installation. And the second answer, there are lots of scripts that can identify system files. Find command on Mac slash Linux is a good one to look into which can quickly identify system files like the infamous DS store dot underscore and thumbs dot db. I think there was a presentation last year from the University of Georgia that mentioned they have some scripts for this as well. I don't have the link on hand. 
Doreen says in the chat, I connected with a small group after the forum last year and would love to expand this group. That must be about the solo archivist group. So uh, uh, we've got a couple more answers. Um, first one about NIST, Creighton Barrett at Dahl has written about using their software directory. Um, and another answer, these files can often be identified based on file extension using something like Tree Size Pro can be useful for sorting and identifying these files and potentially mass deleting them. It's a good option. Uh, Brock uh, Stessy's talk earlier today went into this a bit, just with some examples of directories. Maybe one more refresh and we can move on. Are there tools that can help identify duplicates at the folder level rather than the item level, e.g. in cases where you receive institutional archives, where there are multiple backups on individual workstations and more systemic office-wide backups? It's been tricky for me to deduplicate at scale from the Brunhilde report from a CSV of duplicate hashes. Um, and I actually answered this question earlier today. Um, I didn't know of any, but I was starting to work on something for the Big Curator Python study group um, that would work with uh, uh, Siegfried duplicate CSV and would output a percentage of duplicates in each folder listed in that report. Um, so if anyone wants to work on this, but there is also a couple of great talks earlier today that might have already done some of this work for me. So I'll have to look into those and see if my project makes sense to continue. Um, and we've got some other answers. Doop Guru may be a tool to check out after selecting the folders to compare. You're still reviewing contents at the object level, but after you get used to the UI, it's somewhat easier when compared to Brunhilde or Siegfried. Uh, and the plus one to Dupe Guru, it's been helpful in a project they've been doing to clean up department's network drive, and they've used it to find duplicate images from a transfer of images from a university relations department. They're spread across hundreds of CDs. I've been ingesting the content and then run Dupe, Dupe, Dupe Guru to find the duplicates. Uh, another suggestion for all dupe as a good deduplicating tool for specific directories. Someone in the chat says Duplicate Cleaner has a free version and is great for small shops. All right, we've got a few answers here. I think we're good to move on. There's some chatting around different tools in the the chat, but not related to this question.
anyone know of a way to compile, render, or print scribe like perfect writer final word markup documents from the 1980s? This is actually my question, and it's a very niche thing. So if no one responds immediately, we can we can move on. It's basically similar to Markdown today. People would write in this markup language in the 80s. Uh, I, I don't think, <laughs> thanks, Diane. Um, I don't, to Jess's question about can I tell you more, um, I'm not positive it was used in like commercial publishing, but I think people used it who like were very particular around how their documents were printed and like typeset um, and like a lot of, computer scientists used it for documentation and things. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. I just know the software that was used to create it. And I have a bunch of Word documents. And Farrell asks, is it similar to tech in that way? Yes, I think this was like one of the early versions that led into those sort of like latex uh, markups. And Jess asks if, if I should just learn the language, um, I would like to avoid that. Um, but if worse comes to worse, I guess. Well, anyway, we don't have to stay on this for my own benefit. We can we can move on to the the next question. And we have a round of applause for Jess Farrell and the work she's done for the BCC community. Uh, as the, the host of this event, I think I'll allow it. And if everyone wants to give a, a virtual hand clap now, that would be great. We do really appreciate all the work Jess has done for us and all the contributions she's made. Okay. Was that Thank my last question? Thank you, everybody. Question? That was very nice. That was fun. <laughs> so well deserved. Yeah. Definitely. And yes, Joe, I think it's time to uh, trade off. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That was a really fun. I love that that question got added. Yay to Jess. <laughs> All right. For our next one. Is there a best way to test a given transfer method for metadata retention? For example, I have a donor who wants to either email files or upload files to Google Drive for me to download. I don't think that will properly retain the metadata we want, but I'm having trouble finding documentation to point to or any way to prove that. So we have some answers. I don't have a way to test, but I do have an anecdote that Google Drive deleted EXIF data from image files when I had a donor that wanted to use it for digital delivery. We use Dropbox. I send a file request so the donor does not need to have a certain Dropbox account level with size limitations, and they can upload as much as needed. Next answer says you can identify which metadata are important to maintain for your use and then run test transfers to check whether those metadata are persistent from source to destination. 
And another answer, Google takeout is worth testing for retention of metadata. As I recall, it dumps a decent amount in JSON for documents created in Google Drive, but I wouldn't use it as a transfer method for receiving files from donors unless the donor zips the group of files first. Using zips and Dropbox, OneDrive, or, OneDrive or whatever would work equally well. And I can add from my experience, yeah, you want to package before using something like Google Drive because I've seen us lose um, file system metadata using that. Another answer, syncing works better than downloading from browser. I always suggest zipping content to preserve date, st date stamps and other metadata. <laughs> Google Drive is kind of rough for transfer. There are download size limits depending on export method. That is totally true. Another suggestion in chat, uh, where to go? Zoom call, install exactly on the donor's computer remotely, then transfer via Dropbox. Emily, plus one to asking donor to zip up files. Katie says, I use R clone to get around the data limits and you can also retain date stamps. I've been wanting to test that, so that's great to hear. Plus one for zipping from Margo. Not an answer, but a warning. Do not use iCloud. Downloading files from iCloud changes all the date metadata to the day you download it. Good to know. Plus one, R clone. Use it frequently for large Google Drive transfers. Thanks, Elena. Plus one to know on iCloud. I have similar feelings about um, SharePoint. <laughs> Reconstructing folder hierarchy after downloading in pieces is not fun from Google Drive. Mary, I'm very sorry you had to deal with that. All right, one more refresh, but I think we have got some good answers here. Well, Lara says, we use InSync to download from Google Drive if that was the donor's workspace, but I'd avoid it if that's not where the files already are. That was a solid job. Thank you for that. All right. I think I will move us on to the next question. Oh, wait, let me just make sure. Oh, Joe says plus one for our clone, but it doesn't solve if the cloud service strips metadata on the upload and shared some docs from MIT about this. That is super useful, Joe. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Uh, let's see. Okay. Which reports generated during processing, for example, PII report, reports, Droid file directories, are folks keeping in the ape? This question is borrowed from the example questions, but it's definitely something I wonder about. First answer says, we add them to a folder as we go through the steps of ingest and processing, and we keep the whole folder with the ape. We don't try to weed it down. An exception would be if there is information in there that contains PII. The next answer says, I keep everything generated by Brunhilde. While we're waiting, I'll just plus one to the first answer. We generally keep the reports except for the ones that contain PII. The exception to that is if we're only doing partial processing um, and then we keep the PII reports with a note that they're there uh, to later be dealt with so that people don't have to run it all again. Mm 
Another answer, we keep the file lists manifest with file paths and technical metadata that are generated by Forensic Toolkit in our bags as documentation files. Give it one more moment for any more answers coming in. All right, let's move on. <laughs> when building a digital preservation program from scratch, where is the best place to start and what tools should be put in place at a minimum? This is a great question. Uh, lots of answers. I think some kind of tools to generate and validate checksums is pretty basic, such as Bagit. In terms of equipment, a write blocker of some kind is often a first purchase. Uh, the next one is we established a task force of relevant stakeholders and did an assessment of where we were and what our goals were before we selected tools. Knowing what our goals were helped us establish what types of tools we needed and then did the research to figure out what was available to accomplish those things. There are a lot of helpful tool registries like Copter that helped us figure out what we wanted to use. Uh, the next answer is money and administrative buy-in. Not wrong. Um, some useful initial resources to review are the NDSA Levels of Digital Preservation, with a link to those resources, and the Digital Preservation Coalition's Policy and Business Case Toolkits, also linked. Uh, another um, plus one for the Levels of Digital Preservation to start conceptually. A plus one from Danielle in the chat for performing an assessment first. Another plus one from Tori for goals and assessment. Give it one more moment. <laughs> this question almost sounds like my question. I relate to this completely from Leslie. Couple more answers. Uh, understand where you'll need support from IT folks and communicate with them early and often. A plus one on the NDSC levels and the DPC's RAM. Inventory what you already have. Make a plan for fussy file formats and develop your storage strategy copies. All right. Ari says, check the dope in the chat. Oh, DPOE, that makes more sense. <laughs> it was like, I don't know this one. All right, I, Joe, is it, was that three? I think that was three. Oh, and another, hold on, one more answer from Danielle. Droid is great for helping to create that inventory and DPC a handbook is a great place to start. Awesome. Okay, yes, Joe, I think that was three, if I'm not mistaken, so I'll hand it off to you. Thanks. Um, I think uh, we, we actually might have missed a couple questions that have popped to the top for a progressive stack. Um, I don't know if you can just see them offhand. So let me see, let me refresh once so that, that I can try to catch everything. Um, did we, yeah, okay. So I think this one is the first that we have had pop up since last we checked. 
All right. So speaking of the infamous DS store, uh, dot underscore and thumbs DB, um, our folks mass deleting these asking for a friend and we've got a couple answers in my humble opinion, there's no reason to retain these unless you are interested in emulating someone's desktop environment. I'd say Archimatica automatically deletes these files during its processing workflow, though this can be configured if you want to keep them. Not mass deleting them, but not accessioning them except through disk images of computer hard drives and someone just saying emphatically yes. In the chat, we have a plus one for delete. So it seems like people have spoken for, for deleting them um, for the most part. So we could, oh, someone says, what is this an access copy for ants? They are quite small files. Although I would, I would enjoy creating access copies for ants. It's also very important to not have DS store within bags because it causes issues. It does, yes. Um, Maybe one more refresh and we can move on. How do folks rank removable media types by degradation, degradation speed? What do we need to be most concerned about? Floppies, optical media? Uh, someone has answered, the Canadian Conservation Institute has a useful guideline for the lifespans of different storage media. I didn't know about that. That looks interesting to check out. We've got an answer in the chat. The cheapest CDRs have a very short shelf life. Sorry about those mix CDs you made in the early 2000s.
comment from Farrell. Museum of Obsolete Media doesn't have doesn't include lifespan, but does have a lot of info about various media types. It also just might depend on how the material was kept over its lifespan, like Diane says, you might have kept it in your car baking, um, or like people writing on CDs, the ink can actually bleed into the the underlying data storage layer. Um, and then someone else has written in trying to find the presentation, but the folks from University of Glasgow have gave a helpful presentation on this at IPRES this past fall. Thinking of past Big Curator forums, I think someone previously, previously talked about cleaning bugs out of hard drives, and then someone mentioned about the process of cleaning mold off of floppy disks. So those are all <laughs> concerns, I guess. Oh, I think I missed an answer. The folks, um, these folks did work along these lines, and it's, it looks like a link to a presentation in the University of Illinois Institutional Repository. Um, and in the chat, there was a talk about optical disks at DLF last fall that touched on this too. And we've got a link to the IPRES presentation. Thanks, Lauren. All right, well, I think we've got a good start. And I guess sooner rather than later is, is a good maxim to, to go by. I think that was three for me, Annalise, if you want to take over. Sure thing. Let me see what our next unread one is. I think it looks like this one here. Okay. I see a lot of different tools being thrown out here for digital preservation. I work for a tribe and security is a big thing. What tools are the safest when it comes to digital preservation in a cultural museum where information is highly sensitive and confidential. Google, Amazon, and other similar entities are not feasible for my institution. And I think this was a pretty recent ask, so we'll give folks a couple minutes to take a look at this one. In the meantime, we've got a couple of other links in the chat about uh, obsolete media. So thank you to Margaret and thank you to Lauren who found the uh, the final proceedings from that IPRES presentation and linked to those. One question, a clarifying question I have about this one is when you say digital preservation tools, it sounds like you mean storage options since you mentioned Google and Amazon, but I, I'm wondering if that is what you mean or if you mean in general, like including processing software and things like that.
storage mainly, but also processing. Laura in chat says, I don't think anyone would be recommending Google Drive for preservation. I think so far it's been discussed more for file transfer, but even so it might still be an issue. You might want to explore Box, which is more secure. Here we go. McCurtu is a system that is used for very granular access levels that allow management of culturally sensitive materials. And then Lara's answer has been added. Um, and then I think learning how to use BitCurator's tools and command line tools are probably your best bet in terms of security. You'll have a lot of control over your own environment. If it's about storage, you can consider offline backups like LTO tape. And let's see a couple more options in chat. We use box for file transfer, especially if there is potentially private or secure data. Tori says DLF talk about legacy databases on CD-ROM that talk about risk of, oh, that's for the optical media. A plus one on McCurtu for TK labels. Annalise, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was going to ask you to say what TK means, but Judith put it there in the chat, traditional knowledge. Yep, thank you for that, Judith. Or I suggest consider working with other tribes who have similar needs for storage. Danielle suggests the Sustainable Heritage Network would be a great resource. Wait another moment. Abby says the digital preservation platforms I know of are based on Amazon servers. It is tough to find options that aren't, unless you're hosting your own, um, that aren't some of those bigger names. Uh, let's see, this sounds like a situation where you might want to set up your own server. Right. And cultivate relationships with whoever makes information security decisions at your org to better understand shared concerns. Ari says encryption is a strategy if you also have a protocol to decrypt regularly. And just says there are non Amazon storage options, but I don't know if they are more secure or privacy focused uh, with a link to wasabi.com. Give it one more moment, I think, but we've got some really helpful, I hope, suggestions here. Ari says Digital Bedrock may have some advice as well. Okay, I think I will move us on to the next question. Let's give it. Just make sure we've got all the things popped up that need to be. Okay, I think so we did that one. There we go. What is the best way to view Microsoft Word 1997 files today? I have tried opening them and they contain strange characters. Does this mean they may be encrypted? And we've got a few answers. LibreOffice is usually your best bet. Office 97 files are in an OLE container, so if you are opening them in a regular text editor, you would see many strange characters. A second for LibreOffice. And Quick View Plus is an option with licensing cost. LibreOffice does a pretty decent job rendering as well.
plus one to leave our office in the chat. Also plus one for digital bedrock from the last question. Another plus one for quick view plus for viewing lots of file types, wish it was less spendy. Diane asks, does anyone use emulated environments for appraisal? While we wait for an answer to that, are the documents all written in English? The strange characters could be incorrect rendering of non-English characters. Some answers for Diane, something I'd like to explore more. Currently, no, what I like to someday. Yes, I think I would add my name to that answer as well. Emily says, only when I can't open the file in Libre, I came across a Microsoft binder file a few months ago. That is an option. All right, give it one more moment. Joe suggests try using different encoding in LibreOffice, for example, using OEM US, which can render doc files from DOS. All right. Some really good suggestions here. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll move on to the next question, I think. Oh, one more comment in the chat. Is this the first time text slash character encoding has been mentioned this year? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Did we, this is pretty similar to one of our earlier questions. So I think we'll go through quickly, but what is the best program to use to dedupe at the folder level bonus points for having a GUI? So we have Tree Size Pro, we have potentially Dupe Guru, depending on what degree of control you need at folder level. Meld is one that I've used for Mac. It has a GUI. Um, another uh, answer using tree size, it can create a CSV file of the deleted duplicates too. That's very handy. Uh, I think we will move on. I'm not seeing anything else other than chatting about text encoding. All right. Uh, Ultra Search, suggested by Kari, is another tool by the makers of Tree Size, which is worth looking into. All right, moving on. Was that three? You'd think I could count, but apparently not. It might've been, I guess. I'll, just, I'll do one more. <laughs> <laughs> not a big deal. All right, has anyone come across an ACT WIN database file? I found it hard to open due to the proprietary nature of the software and best I can do is open some information in Excel. Uh, one suggestion, if nobody has better answers, you might wanna reach out to Pronom who are doing active file format work.
This is not one I've heard of. Hari asks, are you trying to appraise or do you need to render the file? So if the asker is here, um, if you don't mind clarifying, that'd be great. Carol says we should plan a GQ subsession specifically about obscure or obsolete file formats. I think that's a great idea. I had a really weird one last year that it would have been really helpful to have somebody to talk to about. Laura has some questions on picked files. <laughs> some of you may have seen on the Google group. Nina says, I'm mainly appraising, but would like to see the full functionality of database for future access. Got it. <laughs> Elvia says the session could be called That's a Weird Format. <laughs> I love it. Seconded. Tori says she might be able to help with picked files. But Nina, it looks like the act win, I'm calling it, uh, seems to be somewhat unheard of. So give it one more second. And I'll pass it off to Joe. Hi there. I am seeking best practices and methods for file name normalization of bulk file groups. Any suggestions on resources that could assist with this process? Thanks. Um, someone in chat said depends on the platform. I'm not sure if that's for this question or not, but Yes, it is. And this, someone said Windows 10. Uh, we've got a couple answers in chat on Windows. Um, had good luck with Renamer. Uh, another answer, bulk rename utility. I've heard of that one. Um, and Farrell said advanced renamer is another option, which I guess is more advanced than regular renamer. Um, someone else is seconding bulk rename utility. Right, maybe one more refresh. Okay, can move on. If you think of an answer, please do add it. Is anyone using archive space to describe born digital archival collections? What are you calling the top container? Are you still considering it a box or calling it something else? 
Uh, I believe Archive stop containers are only for physical things, i.e. boxes. We use digital objects for born digital records. Um, just to provide a counterpoint to that, we use top containers for digital material here at MIT. Um, so it could be used for both, but depends on your, your system. Um, we add an archival object to describe the intellectual content of the digital materials and then a digital object instance with storage access information for those materials. Um, that's similar to what MIT does. Uh, short answer, we plan to use digital object records as the containers slash instances. Each DO will be associated with an archival object that represents the intellectual thing, longer answer, it's complicated, partly because the arch the ASPACE data model for DOs isn't very clear, and our planned approach depends on the type of content, whether there is a one-to-one -one relationship with the description, how many and what types of copies we have, etc. We're in the middle of exploring the range of practices out there and doing some intensive data modeling for digital content to welcome so welcome thought partners and there's an email for anyone who wants to follow up uh, next answer top container item description describes the thing you can pull off the physical shelf i.e media i.e a cdr and folder eight box seven we use a digital object attached to that physical item slash archival object to describe the files not sure what we do for an electronic transfer it hasn't happened yet uh, next answer, we use the instance type of digital folder, which is then pageable through Aon for reading room access. We include digital objects when we have them. And we've got a few more answers. Uh, yes, or at least we plan to. I don't think we would have a top container associated with an archival object unless there was a physical item to be tracked like a box that contains a hard drive or other media. In that case, box still makes sense. Otherwise, I would expect that there would just be a digital object linked to the archival object without a top container. Another answer, yes, definitely. We don't assign a container for digital files. If they are in one of our digital repositories, we use digital objects, but the majority of our born digital materials are not available this way. In that case, they are simply described at the series or file level with an extent and other descriptive info. And most of our collection are hybrids. So we have a mix of ways we describe digital holdings and it can depend on the on the level to which a collection has been processed, how it originally came to us, et cetera. Still figuring out what makes sense for us, but I can share two examples. Recently, a donor gave us an external hard drive full of recordings after we had processed 60 plus cubic feet of materials. I treated it intellectually as a file within the collection's AV series and a scope and content note summarizing the contents of the drive. For the instance info, I gave the box the original drive, I gave the box the original drive is stored in as the parent and the child type is disk. The extent field shares digital volume and carrier information. Access note states that access is granted via a workstation where a copy of the drive's contents are stored. And the second scenario, we got a born digital collection via Google Drive a disaster story for another day. That is a fairly small collection where all content is organized into subfolders. So each folder is basically a series described in scope and contents note, and we don't offer container information. Under extent, we share digital volume. There's also an acquisition note about how we got material and an access note about how the content can be viewed. seems like that generated a lot of discussion. I guess we've got a lot of archive space users in this group. Uh, we've got another chat answer. We use DOs for anything available online. Only our digitized material, but a custom created container type digital content for material we serve up on a limited access laptop in our reading room. We don't have a virtual reading room. Uh, 
Um, okay, that's just from the chat. Uh, like a first answer, we only use top containers for physical things. A DAO has a file version to tell us where to find it in storage. Uh, we intellectually describe materials the same way we do physical materials. We use digital objects to link out to the materials and their respective access repositories, or we will use digital object to link to internal storage location, but that DO isn't published. Another answer in the chat, I also have an automated system that syncs digital surrogates of archival materials to ASpace, and that creates DOs in ASpace when I sync them. Okay, I think lots of perspectives there. We've got a few minutes left if we want to move on. Uh, I think that was three for me, but I can read the next question oh, since. No, I'm good. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> We've only got three mi two minutes. Yeah, left. we probably have time for one more, I think. So let me just make sure. We do have one that popped up to the top. Um, does anyone have an efficient way for reviewing bulk extractor reports with lots of data, particularly when much of the data includes escaped hexadecimal sequences. I guess I could jump in with an answer here. I don't know about it being efficient, but I I use Bulk Reviewer to, to do a lot of review of bulk extractor reports. Um, and the easiest way I found is to load in the bulk extractor reports and start like dismissing stuff either based on the type of feature found or just like looking through individual files and then start dismissing things that are obviously like false flags. Um, and it, it, it helps with those like hexadecimal sequences that may be flagged for, um, may just be like random data that matches what looks like a social security number. We've got lots of plus ones for bulk reviewer in the chat as well. And we are at time. Thank you all so, so much for participating in this session. Uh, as Farrell mentioned in the chat, we have another of these sessions on Thursday. So hopefully we'll be able to get through more of your excellent questions and answers. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all then. Yeah, please keep submitting them. Um, we are happy to, to review more. All right. Oh, and Jess has shared the info for the next session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, membership.